and I've asked them to come to the meeting because they have resources, both tangible and intangible, to which I want access. And so the meeting, while about pushing back the frontiers of ignorance on this particular topic, is also about what are, which of our scarce resources will we contribute and which of our scarce resources will we extract back from this interaction. So the way I want to talk today um, is I want to sort of use that jumping point as negotiation is problem solving and really focus on a series and in fact three stories or myths or misperceptions that we have about negotiation. And these are, um, most a lot, for most of these, um, folks have a very strong view about what the right answer is, and our empirical research has suggested that we're pretty much wrong when we think about what we think the right answer is. So let's talk about three of them. Honesty is the best negotiating policy. Don't ever let them see you sweat. And my goal in this negotiation is to get a yes, to get to agreement. And we're going to start off with that negotiating is the best policy. And one of the things that I think is really interesting um, is that there are a lot of different strategies and tactics that folks use in negotiation. Um, and for folks who are really sort of uh, uncomfortable with the process of negotiation, what they might want to do is sort of really push through, get it done quickly. And one story they tell themselves is, if I honestly exchange information, then we're going to get through this process much more quickly. So one of the things that oftentimes people will ask in a negotiation is, what's your bottom line? You know, what's the least you will accept or the most you will pay, right? If we're thinking about negotiation simply as dollars exchanged, right? And so one of the questions that, because what they're asking you when they say, what's your bottom line, they're really asking you what your reservation price is. What's that point at which you are indifferent between saying yes, getting a deal, or invoking the no, getting an impasse, and perhaps taking your alternative. Now, what's really interesting is that we've actually done research on what happens when you reveal your bottom line. But let's, before we kind of give you that answer, let me ask you the following to engage in a little thought experiment. You and I are negotiating, and you say to me, Okay, Maggie, what's your bottom line here? And I give you an answer. Do you believe me? Well, if you're like most folks, the answer is a resounding no. Because if I tell you what my bottom line is, and we get a deal, the most likely outcome for me is that bottom line. Why would you give me more? I have just told you the least I would accept in this interaction. So the question now is, if I don't really tell you what my bottom line is, what do I tell you? I probably give you a full bottom line where I still have some opportunity to maneuver. So your expectation is whatever I say to you is not really my true bottom line. And so you act on that assumption. That's the story you tell yourself. Now think about the following problem. Well, there's actually two problems. Number one, why would you ask a question in a negotiation to which regardless of what the counterpart says, you wouldn't believe them? You can think about that on your own. But number two is, what if I am that rare species of human being who always tells the truth? Now, there's no big T on my forehead, so you don't know that I am a truth teller. But when you say to me, what's your bottom line? I tell you the truth. Now what happens? Well, it turns out that there is a paradoxical effect. So let's say that we're negotiating, and unbeknownst to you at the time of the negotiation, my bottom line is $50. Now, we're negotiating over some commodity, and you start the bidding price. You're the, um, you're the seller. You want to get $100. Now, you decide to short-circuit the negotiation process, and what you say is, okay, Maggie, here's what I want to do. I'd like to get $100 for these things, but tell me what, really, what's the, what's the most you're willing to pay? Now, again, unknown to you, I'm a truth teller. So I tell you my bottom line, $50, I say. 
Now what happens? Well, you were probably hoping I'd say yes to 100, but so you make a concession. Let's say you go to 80, and I respond with 50. You're probably not happy with my response because you're expecting that I have more to give. You don't expect that that reservation price that I gave you was actually my true reservation price, but it was. So now you get a little concerned, and you're, you might even concede again. You might even say, I don't know, $70, and I say 50 Where is this negotiation going to end? Well, where it's probably not going to end is $50. Because what you are likely to perceive is that I am behaving badly. I am not negotiating in good faith. And therefore, you're going to walk away from the negotiation. Now, notice it is you to whom I have told the truth. $50 was my reservation price. And you are the one walking away. So one of the things that we have discovered from our research is it is the person to whom the reservation price is revealed who is more likely to walk away. Now, notice, I want to be clear here, this is a negotiation situation where you, you the person to whom I've told the truth, cannot verify that that's the truth. Now, in negotiations with my husband, for example, and we've been married for over 30 years, right, he knows where I live, he knows where the bank accounts are, he can verify. Right? So when I say my bottom line is $50, he's probably more likely to believe it because he can verify. But in situations where verification is problematic, then you need to be careful about, about revealing your true bottom line. Now, it also turns out that you do need to reveal information. So let's not get confused about that. For successful negotiation to occur, you're going to have to share information. But information is a form of power. So you need to think about what information you will share and how you will share it. Because not all information is created equal. And so the question, for example, is you need to think, what will I be willing to share incrementally? So I'm going to share some. I'm hoping that you will, in fact, reciprocate that information sharing. But what I'm not going to do is share information that is so vital to my position, my power, that if you don't reciprocate, I'm at a loss. Now, if you go to the other end of that continuum, there are folks who say, you know what, what if we just share everything? Um, that's often been called the open kimono strategy. And that is, to give you sort of the, 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 the rule of thumb is, um, I'll show you mine if you'll show me yours. Right. And in some situations, that might be a reasonable strategy. But there are two big problems for that strategy. The first one is, what if I engage in the open kimono strategy, but you don't reciprocate? I share all my information with you, and you do not follow through with your information. I have lost considerable power in the negotiation, and I am significantly worse off, and probably cannot recover from that. Now, there's another problem, which, well, there's another component which could be a problem, and that is that if we do, in fact, if you reciprocate, I share all my information, you share all your information, then we need to be comfortable sharing the value that we create 50-50. Because once all the information is known, it becomes very difficult and, and incredibly contentious if we decide to share all the information, but I think that I deserve more than 50% of the value that's created. So you need to think very carefully about the kind of information you share, when you share the information, and making sure there's that reciprocity. And if 50-50 isn't your best um, resource allocation, you're not comfortable with that, then be careful about the open kimono strategy. Maggie, could we interject and ask a few questions? Sure. Wonderful. We've had a, a bunch of questions, and <clears throat> one of the big ones is giving examples of how this might work. For, um, for example, if you're looking for a job. So just to give you a classic situation, um, you've got salary and benefits for a VP role, mm -hmm. and you want to get the best offer, the best deal. What do you do? Well, part of what you think about is, um, what kind of information do you want to reveal and how do you want to reveal that information? But it's actually much more complex than that. So you really want to think about 
um, your planning and preparation in the negotiation. So, for example, you need to know what your bottom line is. And that bottom line is about, uh, is influenced by what your alternatives are. So that's a very important piece of information so that you know where it is that you would actually prefer an impasse than to say yes to the deal. One of the things that might be useful for you to consider is, um, and Dina, you mentioned two issues, right? You did salary and, and benefits. And benefits. Um, I think that's a really good strategy to start off with, and that is think about this as a package. Um, and you may want to you may want to put more than just two components to that package: benefits, compensation. It might be all sorts of other things, or break down benefits into multiple issues. Uh, because what you want to do is you want to actually negotiate a package. Now the issue, of, because we're talking about information exchange, um, you know the issue is that information exchange is strategic. So in some situations, I might be willing to share my my alternatives with my with my potential new employer. Part of that depends upon what happens in the negotiation and how it unfolds. I can tell you when I when I was negotiating for my job here at Stanford, I did convey my alternative to my dean um, because that information was very useful in anchoring him on the kind of outcome that I was looking for. So unfortunately it'd be great or Fortunately or unfortunately, it would be really easy if I could just give you six quick steps. But part of it is you need to think strategically uh, about how can I share information, what kind of information might I share. Um, and so you think about what information will push the negotiation forward, and that might be you know, the package, your proposal in a package, um, focusing on what your counterpart is interested in as well. That may be very useful information to share, maybe what's important to you, what's really critical to you. Uh, in this negotiation, other things might be positive and important, but not critical. Sharing what's important might be useful. Maybe you don't want to share what your bottom line is. So, Maggie, what about your salary that you're currently making? Some people will inflate their salary or they'll include their stock options. Or What do you think about sort of that white lie of your salary? Um, the problem with that, I, my view is, is that um, I am happy to be as detailed and as inclusive. So I would say my compensation, and I would may have my stock options in there. I may have all sorts of other components of compensation, but I would convey to my um, in my counterpart that this is a multi-dimensional compensation package. It's not just about what my salary is. Uh, my view is in so we're in this thing of honesty is the best policy. In some respects. Um, you need to be strategic in the information you share. I would be very careful about sharing uh, inaccurate information. That is the sin of commission. That is, I am actively telling you something that is not true. Great. Okay. Thank you. And then, are, is there anything that's too dangerous to reveal or anything that you should never reveal? Well, um, you can start any, any negotiation strategy with, if it starts with never, the answer is probably no, right? Um, you need to think about what, in this particular situation, and as the negotiation unfolds, what information, and as the relationship develops, what information is useful. Um, I would be really hesitant, you know, sort of in an early negotiation to really talk about what my alternatives or my reservation price are. As I said to you, in the Stanford negotiation, I actually did more. Um, and I did share my alternatives eventually, but that was because uh, as the negotiation unfolded uh, and it became clear to me that that was an important piece of information that was going to help my, um, my position rather than hurt it. Great. And we've had a lot of other questions come in as we've been talking, and so I just want to share with the audience that if you were here for a program, like one of Maggie's programs, you'd get the opportunity to talk with Maggie and with the other participants throughout the, the course. Um, not only in the classroom, but also at um, breaks and at meals and at receptions in a more relaxed setting. And yes, the programs are a week long, so we end up spending a lot of time together. In fact, um, um, the, not just breaks uh, and receptions and meals, but the classroom uh, atmosphere is one that encourages this kind of interaction. Um, so for example, in October, there is the uh, Influence and Negotiation Strategies Program. Um, so we still have a few seats left in that one. Uh, in June, there's a Managing Teams for Innovation and Success that I also co-lead. 
And then um, I think in about 10 days, there's a program called the Executive Program for Women Leaders, and I actually don't know if we have any seats left in that, but certainly wouldn't hurt to ask. So uh, let's go on to the next one. This, one is, this is one of my favorite ones. It's like, don't ever let them see you sweat. There is a lot of stories and myths about how do you manage your emotions in negotiations. And let's talk a little bit about that process. Um, there, it, one of the most common notions that I hear from folks, there's lots of situations where people have said, you know, you really need to be very much in control of your emotions. In fact, Howard Rafa, in his first book, The Art and Science of Negotiation, says the importance of self-control, especially of their emotions and visibility. And what he's saying is basically keep your emotions under control. Emotions interfere with your ability to process information. And so you need to sort of be careful, be considered, be disciplined. And Gerald Nuremberg, in a more um, trade book, talks about people in an emotional state do not want to think. They are susceptible to the power of suggestion from a clever opponent. So stay out of that emotional state because it will make you worse off. And I want to sort of have us think about that because we've certainly all seen folks who get so emotional in an interaction that they are no longer processing information. And so in some respects, you know, you don't want to get into a point where, the, where your emotions so take over your cognitive capacity that there really is no information processing information exchange. Absolutely. But there are a lot of variations of emotion and emotional states that are actually quite helpful for us in negotiation. And so think about emotion as information. There was a wonderful study that was done back in the, er in the late 1980s. And what these researchers did is they asked folks to rate how funny cartoons were. And so they, but there were two groups. And in one group, they were asked to rate how funny a cartoon was when they were holding a pen like this. Watch. Or in the other group, when they were holding a pen in their mouth like this. It turns out that how, they, how the participants held the pen changed how funny they thought the cartoons were. When people held the pen like this, it turns out that what they were doing is they were uh, stimulating muscles that are associated with smiling. And when they held the pen like this, they are stimulating the muscles that are associated with frowning. So, you can, so what was happening is they were holding the pen as if they were smiling. They weren't smiling. They were holding a pen. But their muscles were firing that are similar to the muscles that were used in smiling. And so cognitively, because of that proprioception, they felt the cartoons were funnier. And when they held the pen as if they were frowning, they found the cartoons to be less humorous. So it turns out, you know, you people have told you before, I'm sure, somewhere in your life, you know, smile even when you aren't happy. Well, you know what? That actually has some basis in science. So think about how we think about our emotions, that we kind of monitor our emotional states, and that informs us about what it is we care about, what it is that is important to us. Now, emotions can also serve as information to others. And it's really interesting, this is actually something that we, we spent some time doing research on. This is a, one of the studies I cite here at the, in the slide, is one of the first studies that really looked at the impact of people who were expressing emotions uh, not necessarily people who were experiencing those emotions. So uh, I express those emotions. How does that make my counterpart behave? And what these researchers found is that when negotiators express anger, participants who were uh, viewing those negotiations, who were the, who were the, who were the targets of the anger, right, or who thought about being the targets of the anger, so we're just, reading in the, we're just reading a vignette now. We don't even have anybody in the same room. Actually reported that they would concede more to an angry counterpart. And when, we, when, the, when the researchers put them into a negotiation situation where they faced an angry counterpart, they did in fact concede more to the angry counterpart. So folks understand that when I face an angry person, I will actually give more of the resources in order to appease that counterpart. And so 
there is this link uh, between the emotion and our cognition and our action. And so one of the things I want you to sort of just think about for a second is that um, we often think about emotions in negotiation as anger. Um, that's a really common negotiation emotion. But there are many more emotions. But there's been a whole series of studies that have looked at what the impact of emotions are on how we process information. And what they found was that certain emotions are associated with different types of information processing. So emotions that are, that are or associated with certainty, and those type of emotions, by the way, here's the cool thing. It's not about whether the emotion is negative or positive. It's about whether it's associated with certainty or uncertainty. So emotions that are associated with certainty are things like happiness or anger. Those are both certainty-associated emotions. When folks experience anger or happiness, they actually are more likely to think heuristically or shortcut or rules of thumb. So happy and angry people in their research are more likely to split the difference in a negotiation because that's a very clear heuristic compromise. Other emotions we might experience, sadness, uh, surprise, those are uncertainty-inducing emotions. And when we have, when we're uncertain, we actually think in a more systematic way to try to resolve the uncertainty. And so when folks were experiencing um, uh, sadness or uh, they were experiencing surprise, they were more likely to engage in the systematic processing that actually created more value in their negotiations. So value creation, systematic thinking, heuristic thinking, compromise mentality, who gets what. So how your emotions, the emotions you're experiencing, actually affects the, the way in which you think, and the way in which you think affects the kind of outcomes that you get. Now, it turns out that what, in that last discussion, we were talking about actually experienced emotions. Um, there's a, a research study we've just uh, submitted for publication um, that we asked folks to uh, express their emotions strategically. In this particular study, we were looking at surprise. And when we asked folks to express their emotions, their surprise, whether or not they experienced surprise was irrelevant. It's that they expressed surprise to their counterparts. They found that expressing surprise to the counterpart actually increased the information processing and the quality of the outcome from the, from the counterpart's perspective. They actually, the counterpart worked harder to try to resolve the surprise that I experienced. And so one of the strategies that may get your counterpart to think more strategically about negotiation is, and the negotiation outcomes that are possible is, your expression of surprise. You're surprised by their behavior, you're surprised by their proposal, you're surprised by what you're getting from them from across the table. Oh, can I interject? Sure. Thank you. We've had a bunch of questions about anger, basically, and um, if you find yourself being angry or what you should do, or should you try and elicit a certain emotion in someone else, should you try and make them feel defensive? Uh, probably not try to make them. Let's go to the anger one first. Okay. There's a lot of research on anger. Um, it turns out that when I am angry, so, let me, so I told you that anger is a systematic, I'm sorry, is a certainty emotion. The other thing that you probably don't think about is that anger is also an optimistic emotion. Folks don't get angry if they think there's no hope of changing the situation. Folks get angry because they think they can change the situation and make it better for them. So it's optimistic. So expressing your anger actually says this is a change, this is a situation that can be changed. So I think it's important that if you experience anger that you are you experience emotions, that you understand the impact of those emotions. Here's what I think is a real problem. And this is why I particularly chose to look at this particular um, myth, is because when you suppress your emotions, that you're really angry, but you're trying not to show it, your cognitive effort, your cognitive capacity is being used to suppress the expression of emotion. You know, don't look angry, don't cry, don't do whatever those things that do that reflect your anger, right? You're all, you're, you have this huge amount of self-talk, internal dialogue that's going on. What that means is you have no cognitive capacity to be able to respond in the negotiation because all of your effort is being put on, don't look mad, don't look mad, don't be bad, don't be mad, right? So part of the process is you need to be very careful 
about the explicit suppression of emotion. If you get really angry in a negotiation situation, my suggestion to you is you take a break and you do the following. What is it about my counterpart? Why are they, what's important to them? Why are they behaving in a way that is having this effect on me? You need to reappraise the situation to try to figure out how to understand, to, to, basically to understand what your counterpart wants and why they are behaving in this way. The more you are able to reappraise that situation and understand what might be pushing their button, the more you can deal with their anger and it, the less it, it absorbs your cognitive capacity. So you need to be very careful about how you manage your own emotional response. Not suppression, reappraisal. So let's get to the third and the final um, perspective, uh, which is, I think, probably the one that, that touches most of us. And there are so many of us in negotiation, when we negotiate, who see negotiation, the only success, the only criterion for success we have is that we get an agreement. And this is so deeply ingrained that it's really a difficult um, mindset to undo. And part of what I want to sort of, the reason I held this off to last is because I really want you to, to sort of walk away with this in your mind, that this is the myth, this is the story we tell ourselves, that the, my goal is to get to yes. And I want to suggest to you that there are, you could have many goals in a negotiation. So let's think about just a few of them. Maybe my goal in a negotiation is to win. That is, I want to do better than you. Now, this is a very common goal in negotiation, but like the goal of getting to yes, this goal is also problematic. And the reason, for at least, for at least two reasons. The first reason is that winning is actually a relative assessment. We could both do in this negotiation very badly. But if I just do slightly less poorly than you, I win. I'm going to suggest to you that this is not a standard that, to which you want to assess your performance. What you want to know is how well did you do, and that really is an absolute measurement rather than a relative measurement. Secondly, though, if what you really care about is winning, a skilled counterpart can behave in ways that will absolutely convince you that you have won when, in fact, they walk away with more of the value in the interaction. Because, in effect, what they're doing is you're telling them the most important thing to me in this negotiation is to perceive that I have won. And so I will behave in ways that will give you that outcome that you want so much, but the surplus in the negotiation will accrue to me because of the strategies that I use, but I'll frame those strategies in ways that will make it easy for you to believe that you have won. So that's the problem. If you want to win so badly, I can use that to leverage a better deal for me. Now, you may also think about, let's, let's go back to this. We started off with the uh, negotiation between the car dealer and the negotiation between uh, my research team. And I'm negotiating with my research team Maybe my primary goal that I'm interested in is to create knowledge, and that's the source of value, right? Maybe what I want to do is create value in this interaction. And part of what is important in that goal, right, is understanding where the synergy exists between you and me. And so that's what I'm going to be focusing on, to create as much synergy or as much value as I can in the interaction. And the strategies that I take are going to be quite a bit different than the strategies I might take with that new car salesman, right? Because that in that negotiation, I'm trying to claim as much value. So my strategies are going to reflect my goals. Now, for many of us, one of the things that we spend most of our time when we're in official negotiations is doing is trying to get them over with. We are uncomfortable with the negotiation process. We see it as a process where we are not particularly successful. And so the goal is to just get a deal 
and get back to the aspects of our job, our lives, where we feel more competent. And so many of us move too quickly to a deal because we see that getting to yes is the outcome that we care about. I want you, regardless, and, and there are many more goals you could have in the negotiation. These are just exemplars. But I want you to think very carefully about what your superordinate goal should be in a negotiation. In any negotiation you engage in, that negotiation should make you better off than you are before you started the interaction, which means it needs to be an improvement over the status quo or an improvement over what your options are, your alternatives. So this is actually a much higher standard for performance. The goal of a negotiation is not to get a deal. The goal, the goal of a negotiation is to get a good deal. Now, many of us, right, when you before you get into the interaction, are saying, of course, why would I ever take a deal that's bad for me? And yet, if you're honest with yourself, you have taken a deal. You have taken multiple deals. I've taken multiple outcomes where at the moment I said yes, I knew the deal was bad. The deal was bad for me. I would have been better off if I'd walked away, but I didn't walk away. I said yes, and so have you. So we may not walk into a negotiation with the expectation, the hope, the aspiration of a bad deal, but we have all walked out having agreed to a deal that's bad for us. Now, what also happens is, is that we've also taken, we've made, we've, we said yes to proposals that we didn't have a clue whether they were good or bad. We just thought, well, let me just privilege getting a yes, because once I get a yes, you know, I hope it'll turn out okay. We sort of see the outcome of a negotiation is to get a deal, and the notion of getting a good deal, well, that'll be sometime down the future, down the road. Part of the problem is, is that you need to have the discipline to be able to know what a good deal is before you say yes, and not hope that fate or gods or whatever will intervene and make this deal good for you. So what becomes important is, what, how do I know what a good deal is? And there are three criteria we need. The three criteria we need are Number one, we've mentioned this earlier, I need to know what my reservation price is. I need to know what my bottom line is in the negotiation. My bottom line is often influenced by the second aspect, which is the alternatives. What happens to me if this deal fails? And the research is very clear. He or she with the best alternatives walks away, on average, with more value in the negotiation. Why? I have a better set of alternatives. If you want to make a deal, you have, to, you have to be able to propose to me an outcome that makes me better off than my alternative. So the better my alternatives, the better the deals I'm going to demand. And third, and probably something that most folks ignore, is aspirations. I need to have an optimistic assessment of what it is I could achieve. I need to psychologically leverage my expectations up to what's possible, not what my safety net is, that's my alternative, not what my worst possible outcome is, that's my reservation price, but what is an optimistic assessment of what I could achieve. I've got to use my expectations and the way I set my expectations to drive my behavior forward because expectations affect behavior. Expectations drive behavior. And so the higher your expectations, the better on average you perform. The lower your expectations, the worse on average you perform. All right, so why is it that we settle for less? Why is it that we take a deal that might be worth less objectively than our alternatives? Maybe we take a deal that violates our reservation price. This is not an uncommon experience. So why do folks do that? Why don't they simply walk away? Well. It turns out that sometimes the, the self-talk is so strong that the only acceptable outcome in a negotiation is to get an agreement. 
Now, this may sound kind of, of, of sort of off topic, but one of the things that I do um, outside of teaching and research is that I am an avid um, horsewoman, and I really, really, really want to learn how to work cows. So I spend a lot of time, my free time, riding my horses and working cows and roping and doing all sorts of things. And I have folks who help me in that, who facilitate train, help me do better at that job. And one of the things that one of my teachers once told me about my horsemanship is that if you never, ever, ever fall off your horse, and let me just tell you, I never want to fall off my horse. That's, nobody wants to fall off your horse. My horse is really tall. It's a long way to the ground. You don't want to fall off your horse. But if you never, ever, ever fall off your horse, if you never push the envelope, you're really not going to be learning as quickly as you could. We want to create a situation where you don't fall off. You have enough skill and expertise, you don't fall off. But you have to be willing to get to that point, to get to just this side of trouble. In negotiation, if you always say yes, I'm wondering what your aspirations are. I'm wondering if they're too low. And if you have low aspirations, if you have low expectations, you're underachieving. And because you're privileging getting a yes over getting a good deal. And sometimes in order to get a good deal, you have to be willing to walk away. Now, we often might decide that we can't walk away because our options are terrible. I can't possibly lose this job. Some of those assessments are correct. I remember the first, my, during my first negotiations and my first academic job, I didn't negotiate because it was the only reasonable research institution that made me an offer. But as soon as I had alternatives, I was quite willing to negotiate. You need to be very thoughtful. How good are your alternatives? And be a little more risk-taking in your willingness to walk away. And maybe you might choose not to walk away because you've spent so much time negotiating that you can't imagine going through this process again. One of the things that's really important to understand is all that time that you spent negotiating, it's sunk. It's gone. The question is, when you make that deal, that's going forward. And what's the opportunity cost that you're incurring by saying yes? Think about that. So, if you are facing a bad deal, What's available to you? So you're negotiating. You've spent a great deal of time trying to figure out what it is that you need to get in this negotiation, and the negotiation has not gone well. And we've all been in situations where the negotiation has not gone well. What are our options? Well, number one, you do have options. You need to think very creatively before you walk into the negotiation about what your alternatives are. And what's the status quo? Maybe that status quo is better. And it turns out, by the way, that the better your options, the more demanding you will be, the more assertive you will act in the negotiation, and the better your outcomes. So you have options. Now, there are some situations in life where you don't have options, right? If somebody, you know, if you get mugged and somebody puts a gun to your head and says your money or your life, this is not a negotiation, right? Because in a negotiation, you must be able to walk away. And so some situations that may present themselves as negotiations, when, whenever I negotiate, um, if I, if, whenever we try to get a new house, we go out and look for a, a new place to live, um, to buy a property, I have a rule that my husband and I have agreed to. And that is, in that negotiation, he cannot tell me if he falls in love with a particular property over which I'm negotiating. And the reason for that is, is that if he tells me, Maggie, this is the one, I'm in love, I can't imagine living anywhere else, he has just made it impossible for me to negotiate. Because if I negotiate and I lose that house, that he has just told me, you know, is the key to his happiness. 
it's a bad outcome on so many dimensions and for so long. So we have a rule. He can't. He may fall in love with a property, but he can't tell me. He has to be disciplined because I've got to be able to invoke my alternatives. I've got to be able to walk away. The second really important point I want to suggest to you is that negotiation is an interdependent process. No one can force you to say yes. You cannot force anyone to say yes. You need to be able to persuade and influence others, and they need to persuade and influence you to take, to, to agree to an outcome. So what that means is, is that you need to be very careful about how it is you propose solutions. And think about all those bad deals, all those bad deals that you've experienced. Let me just make sure you understand at least one very important point. Because negotiation is an interdependent process, you have agreed to all those bad deals. You voluntarily said yes. So think about the following scenario. You're negotiating, and you've been negotiating for a while on this particular um, issue. Let's say, let's say it's a job negotiation. And the package you've been offered is simply not reasonable. It's a bad deal. But you like the job. And so what you decide, you sort of internally, in an internal dialogue, you say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to go ahead and say yes. I'm not a very good negotiator. You can give all sorts of reasons about why you should go ahead and say yes. But in the end, you say yes. And the deal you get is that bad deal. So let's replay that scenario. But instead of saying yes, you turn to the, your recruiter, you turn to your counterpart, and you say, you know, I would really like this position. I think I could, give, I could provide a lot of value for the organization, but I simply cannot take this, this package. It simply is not, it, doesn't, it, it just doesn't meet my needs. Well, it is possible that your counterpart could say, okay, fine, we'll go to our number two candidate. But it's also possible that your willingness to walk away when the deal is not good for you will provide them with the opportunity to improve that deal. Sometimes when you say to the other side, I cannot agree, that motivates them to provide a package to which you can agree. But in order for that to happen, you need to be willing to walk away. And that takes some discipline, and that takes some practice, and that takes some assessment of how good your alternatives are. We have so many questions that have been coming in, and so can we start with the house one? Because there are a lot of people who are mm -hmm. curious about the house and how how can you um, help yourself? Let's say you fell in love with a property. How can you help yourself not let that get in the way of your negotiations? Well, Dina, the first thing you said is you fell in love with it. Here's yeah. my suggestion to you. Yeah. In negotiation, think and it about could it. be something other than house. Right. Think about think about this. It's really dangerous to fall in love of one of anything. Um, I mean, if you want to think about negotiating a spouse, maybe you might want to fall in love with one. Okay. But absent that one, if I'm out negotiating, if I'm out looking for housing, I need to fall in love with at least two and preferably three. Why? Because then that one isn't so important that I can't walk away. Because I might lose that one, but I still have some great alternatives. That's what's so critical. If you fall in love, by the way, if my husband violates our rule and falls in love with a house and lets me know he falls in love with a the house, then pretty much I'm going to take the, I'm going to, the, the, the seller has told me what they're willing to take and I will give it to them. Right? It's not a negotiation, then it becomes a transaction because I can't afford to walk away. When I took my first job as an academic, as I mentioned, I couldn't afford to walk away. It was too scary. My alternatives were not good. And so I said yes. I didn't even negotiate. And if you fall in love with something, 
you need to be very careful because when you negotiate, while the probabilities are probably very low that the deal won't happen, there is those probabilities. You have to, you have to consider you may lose what you love. Wow. Um, so along those lines then, what if, how can you make the other person feel that they've won more in the negotiation? So you mentioned that you know, everyone wants to, to feel good and you want to feel good about what you've negotiated. And let's say you've just made this huge deal and you feel like you've really made a good thing for yourself. Mm -hmm. How do you make the other person feel great? Well, what's interesting because one of the ways, see, here's a, there, there are many other um, stories we tell ourselves in negotiations. Um, and one of the things that we tell ourselves in negotiations, which is we talked a little bit about this very early on, but very briefly, was this notion that it's a win-lose process. So if, if your counterpart is viewing negotiation as a win-lose, and it, then it becomes clear that if you win, they must lose. So part of what you want to think about is, Let's say that you've done all your homework. You actually know this is an amazing deal for you. You are very happy. The last thing you want to do in a negotiation in front of your counterpart is the dance of joy. Because if you do the dance of joy in public, they know they have lost. So, and I'm using the dance of joy as an analogy, right? You can't appear too happy. Because if they have this belief, they, they are firmly entrenched in the myth of the fixed pie. If whatever I get, I must take from you. If you're happy, I must be unhappy. Part of how you manage that process, that negotiation in the closing moments, is conveying how difficult the negotiation was, how you were really impressed with the quality of, the, of your counterpart. And that, you know, this was, it was just, you know, hit and miss all the way to the end of whether we could get a deal or not because there was, you know, it, this deal was just barely, barely cleared your hurdle. Part of what you're trying to show to your counterpart is, I didn't really win, so you must have. And so think about this zero-sum expectation on the part of your counterpart. And part of it is understanding that while negotiation is uh, is enhanced by value creation. At the end of the day, we need to focus on who gets what and how much do I get and how much do I walk away with. And if my counterpart really wants to win, I need to convey to them by my words and my emotion expression, my behavior, that they have won. So one last question in the amount of time we have, and that is, people brought up gender and negotiation, and I know that you have some resources that you can share. Can you touch on that briefly? Um, there are differences in how men and women negotiate, and um, if you want to know more, I've got a slide here that I think is really um, helpful. Um, you know, one of the one of the um, the folks, you know, there's been a lot of discussion recently with uh, Sheryl Sandberg's book on Lean In, but if you think about one of the folks who really, some of the folks who really started this topic early on, I'd like you to sort of consider the book, uh, Women Don't Ask, Negotiating the Gender Divide. Uh, it's one of the early books that really talks about um, how men and women negotiate differently. And um, Linda Babcock and Sarah Lashavir wrote this. This is, I'm suggesting the 2003 book because it's really the research book. Uh, I believe they have a book out in 2008, same authors, um, which is more of a summary uh, and not so research oriented, but I can tell you that for me, the research is, is, is really um, depressing and engaging at the same time. Um, the second book I'd suggest uh, is a book that my colleague Max Bazerman and I wrote in 1992. It's old, but there's some real good stuff in it still. If you have not read Robert Cialdini and his work on influence, it's certainly an important um, and, and critical resource. Um, I would uh, strongly recommend that you look at uh, Bob Cialdini's work. And if you're looking for some holiday gifts in 2014 or you want to sort of provide your friends with some ways to negotiate better, uh, my colleague Thomas Lees and I are writing a book which uh, the working title right now is Getting More of What You Want. Uh, it will be published by Basic Books and we're hoping for a 2014 publication date. 
And so, you know, every 20 or so, 20, 22 years, I write a book on negotiation, and the next one's coming out in 2014. So I'd love for you to pre-order it. <laughs> okay. And once again, thank you. Uh, uh, we got a few more. We got a couple of minutes, don't we? Um, yes, we have a sort of summary. Okay. Um, to wrap up, um, there there were just so many questions, and so I just want to thank you very much for for going through everything and um, for your informative presentation. I want to thank the audience um, for their active participation as well. And the webinar was organized to give a preview of the type of content found in several of our programs, and as Maggie mentioned, she's actually a director or co-director on several different programs. Uh, that you might find interesting. There is the negotiation program that she mentioned that's coming up in October. And that's called Influence and Negotiation Strategies. Right, and so if, if this has been really interesting to you and you want to um, go more in depth as to how you might be able to solve some of your negotiation challenges, I highly recommend looking into that program. Um, Maggie also has a, a program on teams, and as we all know, working in teams can provide different challenges. and as you mentioned, the problem solving is negotiation. So you can think about create. You can sort of think about creating value and creating synergy. This is the common theme of, of the kind of work that I do, and whether we typically focus on synergy and teams and value and negotiation, but it's the same concept. And so how and we we spend some time talking. The program is called Managing Teams for Innovation and Success. Great. And then the one you mentioned that's coming up next month that there might not be spots for, but. If a try. <laughs> but, but if you are interested in those gender differences, and it's really powerful to be in a room with all women executives and to be able to share the whole week of, um, of material. And so please watch for an email from us in the next few weeks um, with a link to this recording. If you want additional information about any of our programs, you can go to our website. And uh, we hope to see you on campus at a future program. And thank you very much for your participation. Thank you.